as I mentioned, this can be a real white elephant here. This can be a real <laughs> uh, area where fights will and can't begin. And it is commonly taught within the ranks of Christendom that Acts chapter 2 is the birthday for the church. And uh, we're going to go through some of the passages and demonstrate that nothing brand new begins, although something does begin. And I want to make a distinction here. There's a difference between something that is beginning and the actual, quote, birth of a new church, okay? So we're going to be talking about Pentecost. And that means we're going to look at just uh, some things back there in the Old Testament so we are a little bit familiar with the calendar of redemption. We're going to be hopefully a little familiar with a prophetic schedule that God provides. And we're going to address, we're not going to study the seven feast days. We're going to concentrate specifically on the day of Pentecost. But we need to be familiar with some feast days that God instituted as memorials for the nation of Israel. And maybe I better identify the chicken scratch here real quick. Uh, the seven feast days established and instituted by God in, Re in Leviticus chapter 23, you have the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you have the Feast of First Fruits. Then you have the Feast of Pentecost, okay, which is what we're going to be concentrating on this evening. Then you have the Feast of Trumpets, uh, the Atonement, and then Tabernacles. Okay, Real quickly, what each of these feasts is doing is memorializing some things that either has happened to the nation of Israel or things that will happen to the nation of Israel. Okay, The uh, Feast of Passover is a memorial commemorating the redemption and deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. Okay, The Feast of Unleavened Bread is uh, instituted so that Israel will remember that she is holy and set apart unto God. The Feast of First Fruits is going to instruct Israel regarding a promise regarding national resurrection. And I'm going to skip uh, Pentecost for just a second. The uh, Feast of Trumpets is going to uh, establish the promise and hope of the regathering of the nation of Israel. The Feast of Atonement uh, has to do with the national cleansing of Israel. And then the last feast, which is uh, Tabernacles, uh, that is going to be a memorial which uh, is, is foreseeing Israel's millennial rest. Okay, And I'm going to use two terms here, type and anti-type. Okay? In Leviticus 23, you have these feasts that serve as types. They're shadows. They're figures. The anti-type would be the actual uh, um, thing that is being represented. So if the Feast of Passover is uh, commemorating and memorializing, I should say, redemption and deliverance, well, there is an anti-type. Okay? There's going to be the actual fulfillment of that type. I say all of that because what we're witnessing here in Acts chapter 2, let's look there at verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was what? Fully, Fully come. The type that is instituted in Leviticus chapter 23 regarding Pentecost, which has to do with the calling out of the first fruits, is now, according to verse 1, fully what? Come. Come. In other words, the anti-type is now taking place. Historically, the anti-type of the type, the feast, is now happening. So the, the, the error that the church makes, I think it was Pastor Stan who called it the great blunder of the church, is assuming that something brand new is occurring here in Acts chapter 2. Now, just so that we get a feel for the word, notice, fully come. Okay? Go to Matthew uh, chapter uh, 5. Matthew chapter 5. And, and again, just so that we uh, get a feel for the usage of the word fully. Okay? When the Lord Jesus Christ uh, launches his ministry, obviously, as a minister of the circumcision, notice in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not 
that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Fulfill. So, what the Lord Jesus is saying here simply is this. Listen, there are, by the way, you notice how he's being accused of destroying the law. Okay, but anyway, the, the law uh, and the prophets already provided information, it provided prophecy, it made predictions regarding the identity and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember? Keep your finger here. Go to Luke chapter 24. If you recall in Luke chapter 24, and sadly, his uh, immediate uh, uh, peers, his group there, uh, the apostles, they were ignorant uh, of the uh, scriptures regarding his resurrection and so forth. But, but notice in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, notice, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? Me. Me. So, uh, at the end of his ministry, this is obviously post-resurrection, uh, he actually says that the things that are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets are what? Fulfilled. So when we read, for example, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he launches his ministry by saying, hey, don't think I'm here to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. The law and the prophets, now I'm going to back up a little bit here, is the law and the prophets, they provided information that would enable the nation of Israel to, to properly and accurately identify Messiah. The fingerprint of Messiah is already given in the Old Testament. So when the Lord Jesus says, I'm here to fulfill it, he is the antitype of some information that was already given. Okay, so just keep that, that idea in mind. I'm not here to destroy the law, but I'm come to fulfill it. Now I know most people, they assume the Lord Jesus is merely suggesting that I'm going to live my life in perfect accordance to the requirements, uh, commands, and ordinances of the law. By the way, is that a true statement? It is a true statement, but there's more going on than Jesus Christ living a sinless life in absolute uh, harmony with and, and perfectly uh, as taught by the law and the prophets. That is a true statement. What he's saying is, I'm going to fulfill what the prophets and the law is saying about Messiah. At the end of his ministry, he's got to educate his apostles, and he's literally got to open up their understanding, okay? Because it's fulfilled now. He accomplished what the prophets and the law uh, of Moses was saying about the identity uh, of Messiah. So, so with that in mind, the idea of fulfilling something, when we go to, go, go to Acts chapter 2 again, so when we read Acts, Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the verse is telling us that the day of Pentecost was fully come, it's, it's now demonstrating that what the Feast of Pentecost is typifying, what it represented, what it was communicating by way of shadow and figure, is now fully what? The type is going to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening on this particular day. Okay? So, uh, uh, when we learn about what is happening, keep in mind, nothing brand new is, a happening, is occurring here. Always remember, when we rightly divide the word of truth, when the Apostle Paul teaches some things about the ushering in of the dispensation of the grace of God, when he uh, is given some information regarding this uh, new man, this new creature, this one body, which is called the, the church, the body of Christ. When the, the Apostle Paul is given some information about a unique dispensation called grace and a unique uh, uh, gospel called uh, the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ. When the Apostle Paul is given information about the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, it is completely, radically brand new revelation. 
That is not what's happening in Acts chapter 2. It now is fully calm. There is a continuity in Acts chapter 2, a continuity with some information that the Old Testament has already given. The church will insist this is the start of the church. Nothing is starting per se. Rather, something's being fulfilled. You see the difference there, mm -hmm. I trust. And as we progress here a little bit more, I hope that we truly will see uh, that uh, nothing new per se, but there is a natural continuity with what that feast was already teaching. And we're going to look at that in just a second. Go back to, to Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Okay? Matthew chapter 3. And um, we're, we're going to go eventually to the Old Testament, and I promise we're not going to stay here till 11 o'clock at night. Okay? We're, we're not going to do that. But um, when we read Acts chapter 2, when the, the day of Pentecost was fully come, a, the Holy Ghost now launches his ministry, okay? The Holy Spirit being poured out in Acts chapter 2 is consistent with what the Lord Jesus was already teaching. For example, Matthew chapter 3, uh, now this is of course John the Baptist speaking, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the who? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Ghost. And with fire. Now we're not going to address the issue of the baptism with fire. It's not a good thing, okay? But, but wait a minute. John the Baptist is already providing a warning to the unbelieving remnant that, hey, um, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 now has everything to do with this baptizing or this baptism with who? The Holy Ghost. If we go over to Luke chapter 24 again, go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And I kind of, you, maybe I, I would suggest if you have a little bookmark in Acts chapter 2, because you know, we're going to be flipping you know, back and forth. Luke chapter 24, and notice verse 49. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Right? Go over to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, and notice uh, the Lord is saying, listen, wait, just wait. There's going to be a baptism with the Holy Ghost, and, and now he's going to say, hey, hey, you wait there, they're going to wait in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse uh, 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. <coughs> and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. So, the Lord Jesus, John the Baptist, already predicted at the beginning of Christ's messianic ministry, he's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. At the end of his ministry, post-resurrection, uh, he instructs his disciples, you're going to head to Jerusalem, and you're going to wait until you're endued with power on high. Acts chapter 1 begins with the Lord Jesus Christ once again reiterating, you hang there, you wait in Jerusalem, because... Not many days hence, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost comes. Did Jesus say anything about, I'm going to start a church? But is something going to begin? Now, I'm going to go over to Acts. Go to Acts chapter 2 again. So let's just read Acts chapter 2 and then we're going to go to chapter 11. But look here at Acts chapter 2, verse 1 again. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, here it is. We're now going to fulfill the type. 
Jesus is now going to fulfill what the feast day is representing. And it has to do with the literal person of the, of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues. This is what's now beginning. There's nothing about a church that's starting. No birthday being held in Acts chapter 2. Now there's going to be a birthday, I'm sure, celebrated for Paula. But, but there's no... Oh, wait a minute. This is the Holy Ghost coming. Notice in Acts chapter 11. If you go to Acts chapter 11, and notice here at verse 15. Now, this is a real interesting verse. Acts chapter 11, and notice verse 15. Uh, here's Peter, you know, explaining himself. Explaining himself. <laughs> Poor Peter. You know, Peter, what are you doing hanging with, Gentile, with, with Cornelius and so on? So anyway, Peter's, you know, he's providing a, a defense, if you will. Look there at verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. I'm talking about Cornelius and his household, right? As on us at the what? Beginning. When was the beginning? Acts chapter 2. So let's think about this. Did something begin in Acts chapter 2? Yes. yes. But as far as we know, what have we read thus far? There's a promise, right? What is the promise that is made? The Holy Ghost is coming. Now we're going we're gonna to demonstrate. God promised that in the Old Testament. Okay? Even the Lord, John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit to endue the disciples with power was actually Old Testament prophecy. Nothing new. Again, continuity with the prophetic program. Now it is interesting, verse 15 tells us that uh, something does begin. So go back to Acts chapter 2. That helps me understand verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Something is beginning. But you know what's beginning? Not any church. Look there at verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the what? Last, Last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit. This is the beginning of the end. end. Now, let me say this. I've been reading some church and kind of interesting Churchill. He said so Churchill was such a smart guy. <laughs> These guys are genetic freaks. I mean, the mind that these guys have. And so, remember, England is now battling Germany by herself, you know. And, um, and of course, uh, England, Churchill, uh, pleading with America to enter World War II. And, and there was a bit of reluctancy and so forth. And so, forth. so finally, uh, Roosevelt, okay, the United States enters into World War II. And what was, of course, the famous D-Day. Remember D-Day? And uh, the storm in the beaches of Normandy. Uh, one of Churchill's uh, political staffers uh, on D-Day turned to Churchill and, and said, the beginning of the end. And Churchill turned and responded, no, the end of the beginning. And what Churchill meant was, wait a minute, England was fighting for a number of years. The beginning was England fighting with Germany, and England was beginning to struggle, and England needed U.S. involvement. We understand that. In Churchill's thinking, this was the end of the beginning. England was already fighting Germany. And so the way Churchill was thinking, obviously, was we were already in this battle. Now the beginning is coming to an end, but now they're entering into a new phase. I'm going to say it this way. Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of the end. Acts chapter 7, and, and I didn't mean to do this, I was just sort of thinking about it. That's the problem when you're thinking <laughs> it's trying to Go to Acts chapter 7. If Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of the end, and by the way, it is the beginning of the end, because Peter says this is the last days, according to Joel chapter 2, right? Well, if, if Acts 2 is the beginning of the end, you know what Acts chapter 7 is? Acts chapter 7? 
and verse 56, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. This is the end of the beginning. God is trying to begin something on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, which is the fulfillment of a promise regarding the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And it started in Acts 2, and approximately one year later, it ends in failure. Acts 7 is the end of the beginning of Acts chapter 2. And when we kind of view Acts chapters 1 through 7 that way, we become, uh, we, we then realize that Acts chapter 2 is not the start of a church. Acts is not a doctrine or history which is communicating um, the, uh, the continuation of the beginning of some church. But what Acts does, especially Acts chapters uh, 1 through 7, is chronicling for us the failure of the nation of Israel. And that's really the key in understanding the book of Acts. Acts is not doctrine given to the church. It's, it's uh, a historic account given to the nation of Israel regarding her fall. Okay? So anyway, going back to Acts chapter 2, um, when, when we read verse 1, right off the bat, we, we're now kind of orienting ourselves to what's going on in light of Israel's program. The day of Pentecost was fully come. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit now comes down and empowers the, the apostles and so forth. Let's talk about what the Feast of Pentecost was all about and how it is. Acts chapter 2 now is truly the anti-type. Whatever that feast represented is now being fully uh, implemented. Now, it's not completed, but it's now fully come. It's beginning, okay? Go, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. And again, the Leviticus chapter 23 will give, obviously to the nation of Israel, it gives to us, these seven specific feasts. And, and these feasts are a, a you know, prophetic calendar, if you will, a prophetic schedule for the benefit of the nation of Israel. And what I'm going to do, we're not going to look at all of these feasts, all right? We just aren't going to do that. Uh, it's late. There's a lot of information. We're going to just skip the first three feasts. But after Passover, the feast of Passover begins on the 14th day of the month of Abed. Fifty days later is when Israel is to observe Pentecost, okay? And that's consistent with the record there uh, in Acts. But let's just look here in Leviticus chapter 23 for a moment. Verse 5 is the Passover, okay? The interesting thing here about Passover is there are no details in Leviticus chapter 23 about how to do it. All the other feast days there is detail about how to observe Passover. It's kind of interesting. And there's a, a, a unique reason for that. Look at verse 5. In the 14th day of the first month, at even it is the Lord's Passover. Verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month, it's the feast of what? Unleavened bread. And now the Lord tells them what they're supposed to be doing during the feast of unleavened bread. He does it for the Feast of First Fruits. He does it for Pentecost. He does it for um, uh, the, the, the Feast of Trumpets. He does it for the Day of Atonement. He does it for the Feast of Tabernacles. Why is it there is absolutely no detail given in verse 5 regarding the Lord's Passover? So I'll let you guys figure that out. <laughs> so verse, verse 6, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse Ten, you have the feast of first fruits. Now, verse sixteen. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And then there's some information about uh, the lambs that are supposed to be sacrificed, so on and so forth. So, 
Let's look at the type here. The Feast of Pentecost involves, it's the 50, 50 days after uh, Passover, right? Verse 17, you're supposed to bring two wave loaves, and then verse 17 says that they're supposed to be bacon with leaven, and then the Lord ends verse 17 by saying, they are the first fruits unto who? The Lord. So can you imagine a Jew for about a thousand, the nation of Israel for what, 800 years or whatever. So they're observing this feast every year. And, and you know, the Lord, it's, it's rather okay. Now we've got to get two weight loaves. We've got to have leaven in it. We've got to have, um, where they're going to be the first fruit. And then there are all these lambs. And you're supposed to sacrifice some goats. And so on and so on and so forth. Okay? That's the type. Acts chapter 2, it's fully come. In what way? In what sense? So when we go back to Acts chapter 2, go back to Acts chapter 2, what the, the Feast of Pentecost represents is the calling out of the first fruits. Okay? I already, we're already gone. If we kept our figure there in, Le, in Leviticus 23, verse 17, the Lord said, you have two wave loaves, right? Two, two loaves of bread. And they're supposed to be made with leaven. And the Lord says, these are the first fruits. I don't want to complicate anything. But you have the Feast of First Fruits. After the Feast of First Fruits, you have these two loaves. And, and the Lord says, those are the first fruits. So let's just think about, well, what's happening beginning in Acts chapter 2? Beginning in Acts chapter 2, you have certainly the disciples filled with the Holy Ghost. And you know what the Holy Ghost now begins to do in Acts chapter 2? He's fulfilling the typology. The Holy Spirit on that day is now going to begin to call out the first fruits of Israel. Go to James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1. And do you, do you remember the language, for example, that James would use here? James chapter 1, and notice there in, in verse 18, okay? James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we will be a kind of what? First fruits. First fruits of his creatures. Huh. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and look there at verse uh, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, remember that, that issue of the resurrection. You know what Peter and the other apostles are doing in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost fully come? They're filled with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost now is you filling these apostles up, correct? And they're speaking in tongues. And now Peter is addressing the nation of Israel, and Peter is going to stand empowered by the Holy Spirit as a testimony to the resurrection of the very Messiah Israel is guilty of crucifying. We're beginning to see some, some again, the end of, we're seeing what the feast is representing. The Holy Spirit is going to testify the guy, the king you killed is now raised from the dead. And because of that resurrection, Peter, in turn, is going to communicate to the nation of Israel, you know what you're going to have to do, Israel? You're going to have to turn or save yourself from this untoward generation. You're going to have to come out of the apostasy. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. See the issue of the first fruits? Go over to verse 23. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All right, real quickly. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3. That which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. That which is born of the spirit, spirit is spirit. spirit. Well, what's going on in Acts chapter 2? Who's coming? Who came down? Holy spirit. The, spirit. the Spirit. The Holy Spirit now is beginning to do something by calling out the first fruits of Israel. They're being born again. That, 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 that when John chapter 3, you know, that which is of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the, uh, of the Spirit is spirit. And then remember the Lord, he says, you must be born what? Yeah. Well, guess what's happening in Acts chapter 2? Not a new church, but you're beginning to witness these believing members of Israel who are now experiencing the new birth. The Holy Spirit is coming down. The Holy Spirit came down. And the Holy Spirit now is the agent which is going to implement the provisions of the new covenant. It's fully come, folks. Nothing new in the sense of a brand new agency, but rather the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, go over, for example, go over to uh, Acts chapter uh, uh, 4. Go to Acts chapter 4. And, and notice in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, did you catch verse 3? And with great power... Now, where are they getting this power? Remember the Lord said, you're going to be endued with power. So with great, that is, they're filled with who? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. And with great power, that is, through the, the agency of the Holy Spirit, gave the apostles witness of the what? Resurrection of the Lord Jesus. What's happening here is, if you go compare this to Acts chapter 2, uh, remember what Peter begins doing here in Acts chapter 2. If you, you, well, look there, verse 22, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Peter immediately preaches the resurrection, does he not? The Holy Spirit is empowering these disciples to confront the nation of Israel to indict them not only for the crucifixion and the, uh, the, the death by wicked hands, but guess what the Holy Spirit is testifying? He rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. And from verse 24 all the way down, so verse 35, Peter's talking about resurrection. Verse 35, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Now verse 36, here's the summation. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The one you've killed is the same one the Father raised up as Lord and Christ uh, to sit upon David's throne as king. The Holy Spirit is instrumental in testifying through these apostles by way of supernatural power, signs, wonders, and miracles. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Notice again verse 17. And it, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Well, why? What are they doing? They're communicating to Israel. They're responsible for the crucifixion of Messiah, but the Father raised them up from the dead. Now, 
That's also going to be preached out there in the future. Uh, I wanted to go real quick, go back to chapter 4 here. Go back to chapter 4. Notice there verse 33. When the verse says, And great power, uh, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That's the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 12. If you go to Zechariah chapter 12, and uh, notice in Zechariah, second to the last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 12, and notice verse 10. Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. You see the spirit of grace? That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit. So when, when you begin to examine the activity and, and, and uh, the, the work of God the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, it's consistent with what prophecy is saying. But more importantly, there is a fulfillment of the type. And the Holy Spirit is now using these apostles to testify to the nation of Israel. Messiah was raised up from the dead. And now they're being used to call the first fruits out of apostasy. Go back to Acts chapter 2. And notice that's exactly what Peter now is going to do. Acts chapter 2. Um, Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 37. Uh, well, we did read verse 30. Yeah, we read verse 36. Uh, verse 37. Now when they were... When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 40. And with many other words to be testified and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward <coughs> what? And when they submitted to the baptism for the remission of sins, they received the Holy Ghost. James and Peter says, guess what? You're now the begotten of God. You now are the, James says, chapter 1, verse 18, you're a kind of first fruits. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 2. The first fruit terminology is Leviticus chapter 23. The Holy Ghost language, oh, let's look at what the prophets did say about the Holy Ghost. Go back to uh, Isaiah chapter 32. If we go to Isaiah chapter 32. Um, again, nothing new, but something does begin. Isaiah chapter 32. And notice there at verse 15. Isaiah 50, uh, 32, I'm sorry. Isaiah 32. And look there at verse 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for forth. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. Guess what's happening in Acts chapter 2? It's come. It's fully come. Go over to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, the Old Testament over and over again actually predicts the Spirit coming. And working. And of course, we're familiar. With, we're, I think we're familiar with Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, you're familiar with the, the, the new covenant language. Uh, obviously, in uh, in Jeremiah chapter uh, 31. Behold, um, that's actually not the verse I wanted there. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. I'm sorry. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And uh, uh, verse 24. Okay, Ezekiel chapter uh, 36, verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Acts chapter 2, it's fully, it's happening. It's happening. 
The provision here of the new covenant includes a new spirit. God's going to put His spirit within the believing remnant. And because of that new spirit, the believing remnant will walk in God's statutes and keep His judgments. So uh, this is all consistent with what the prophets have already predicted. Uh, one more item in this regard. The Feast of, uh, of Pentecost. You had two loaves. Remember that? There were two loaves. What do you, th well, well, again, what do you think those two loaves represent? Two. Okay. Go to Acts chapter uh, 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And notice there in Acts chapter 2. And verse 20. Uh, let's read verse 14. Acts chapter 2. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, The men of Judea. Look there at verse 22. Ye men of Israel. Do you remember there are two houses in the Old Testament? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Peter, do you notice how Peter's addressing both houses? So, so wait, you look at the, the feast. Uh, you have these two loaves. And it's interesting, in Acts chapter 2, Peter's addressing the two houses. The house of Israel and the house of Judah. And, and what else? Uh, we already said some things about the first fruits. But there was, what is it about those loaves? What, what had to be in those loaves? Leaven. 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 Now, what does leaven represent? Um, well, go over to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. But we go to Hebrews chapter 3 and then Numbers chapter 11. I know, the eyes are getting drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost done. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. And then, of course, Hebrews chapter chapter 3, okay? And let's read Hebrews chapter 3. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do that when I go to the book of Numbers every time. Have like, you ever tried reading the book of Numbers? Oh, man. Oh. It's okay. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, look there at verse 8. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Drop down to verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the what? Provocation. Now you see the Hebrew warning, don't make the same mistake. What mistake did Israel make in the past? Numbers chapter 11. And this is something that we learn about Israel's past. Numbers chapter 11. And look there at verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lot. Do you see the mixed multitude? <clears throat> what Does leaven represent something good or something bad? Leaven represents evil, by the way. You know, unleavened, you know, remember Paul says something, you are unleavened. Anyway, so, so what God is doing by way of hype, there's a feast. Two loaves representing the house of Judah, representing the house of Israel. But there has to be leaven. Leaven represents the mixed multitude. What is Peter doing, empowered by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2? Isn't he the one who is saying, save yourself from where? This untoward. Israel is a mixed multitude. Spiritually, Israel is in a state of, 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 of they're, they're not a pure nation. They're not a cleansed nation. Just as in the past, there is a mixed multitude, those two loaves represent the mixed multitude. And what the Holy Spirit is doing, number one, testifying by way of power that God raised up the crucified Messiah from the dead. But what the Holy Spirit is also doing is calling out the first fruits from the mixed multitude. Save yourself from this untoward generation. Thus far, the last how long have I been doing this? Anything about a brand new entity called the church, the body of Christ. Absolutely not. When you read Acts chapter 2, we keep it in its proper dispensational context. It is Jewish. 
Real quick, and I know we're all starting to go to Colossians chapter 2. Keith Blades, a number of years ago, he actually produced a list of contrast between Acts chapter 2 and what God is doing in the dispensation of the grace of God. And I commend that list to you. And there are some obvious differences between what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace and what God was doing in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is Jewish. It's consistent with the Jewish feast days. It's consistent with Joel chapter 2. It's called the last days. It's consistent with what God promised to do in pouring out His Spirit. Even Peter says, hey, it began back there. But it's the beginning of the last days. It, it's, it's so Jewish. Yeah. And yet, what does tradition constantly push? It's the church the by the church. church. Yeah. And yet, it does end in failure when you get to act. Then the church has failed by the time you get to action. But anyway, just a couple of things to point out. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Uh, quite interesting. Is the church, the body of Christ, ever instructed to observe any kind of a feast day? No. no. Absolutely not. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Colossians chapter 2. And we read verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of the holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to what? Come. Uh -huh. come. Paul wrote this 30 years after Pentecost. So guess what Paul is saying? It's still what? This, these holy days, this is all a shadow of things to come. And we're going to wind it down here. Something begins in Acts 2, but it didn't come to its completion. If you read Acts chapter 2, it started. It's the beginning of the end. But sadly, Acts 7, it was the end of the beginning. It is going to resume in the future. The day of Pentecost is literally going to be completed out there in the future, as well as the remaining feast days, okay? In the future, Israel is going to be regathered, Israel is going to be cleansed, and ultimately Israel is going to enjoy millennial rest, which is what the remaining feasts represent, okay? The church, the body of Christ, we have absolutely no part and parcel in anything that's going on in Acts chapter 2. Father, we do thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you, Father, again for the template of the right division, and as we apply that, uh, that method, May, may we identify who we are, and we may be certain to guard against confusing ourselves with, with the, the folks, the people that, that we are not. May we never view ourselves as a continuation of, of Israel's program, as any kind of a replacement of Israel's program, uh, but may we clearly understand we are a very unique and distinct body of people, the church which is the body of Christ, and uh, we again thank you for that truth in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your patience.